Hello and welcome. Thanks for tuning in to Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier. Today we're talking about housing. Uh, we're talking about housing solutions, housing design, specifically for Vermont's aging population, how we can retrofit and redesign our housing stock uh, to better accommodate Vermonters of all ages um, and address our state's housing shortage. So to dig into this subject today, we're joined by Taylor Stewart, who is an architect as well as an author uh, of the book Conscious Home Design. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Taylor. Really appreciate hey, it. Hey, Bobby. Yeah, glad to be here. Awesome. So let's jump right in. Uh, sure. We know Vermont is one of the oldest states in the country, mm -hmm. um, and we're also in the middle of a housing crisis. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we, there's been a lot of analysis about both of these issues in a couple different ways, in a couple different lenses. There's certainly a lot of overlap in, in these two um, and these two phenomena. What are you seeing in uh, Vermont communities and in the data that you're looking at to make sense of these two issues and, um, and solutions that might be bubbling up that address both of these trends in tandem? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, Vermont Housing Finance Agency has said we need 30 new thousand homes or, or dwelling units, whether it's an apartment or, for, you know, independent. Uh, freestanding single-family home, uh, 30,000 new by the end of the decade, and that's um, going to be difficult to, to achieve, honestly. Um, but it shows that we have a strong um, a strong need for for new housing. Uh, a lot of our housing stock, it's you know, it's old and it's maybe not uh, the right size. You know, a lot of um, you know people are living differently today than you know than they did 100 years ago. And uh, we also are having, you know, like you mentioned, the, the aging population. So we're now tied with Florida for, um, you know, percentage of, of our population who is 65 years or, or older. You know, one in five Vermonters is uh, retirement age. And so, you know, that a lot of people are finding themselves as they retire out, they're on a fixed income and maybe need to uh, scale back their, their lifestyle a little bit, or they have an empty nest and they don't and they no longer need three or four bedroom homes. And why are they maintaining all that, you know, space, you know, collecting dust when when really it's not appropriate for their lifestyle anymore? So, um, you know, that's really um, that's one of the demographics that we're that we're needing uh, attention to is uh, elderly population who, who are aging, need to age in place um, house, but also young people, uh, starter homes, you know, people that go off, that, that leaves the state to explore, adventure, get some experience, go to college, whatever, um, see something that's different than Vermont, uh, but want to come home. Uh, want to come home to their, to their roots, to their, to their family, to the, the, the state they love. And so, you know, people are returning and there, there may not be um, adequate housing for, for, for the young adults as well. So these are the real two, um, what, what, what Vermont is calling the missing middle mm -hmm. housing. You know, so that's, the, that's really uh, the crisis as, as I see it in terms of the, where the demand um, uh, shortage is. Right. Supply shortages, that's right. the demand. Right, and you mentioned, you know, VHFA has, is seeing a need for 30,000 new units, not necessarily new houses, but um, new dwellings um, for folks to live, which can look different from how we sometimes think of, you know, affordable housing or, or think of building sure. building out the missing middle. Um, you know, how are you thinking about that in terms of dwelling units, um, you know, maybe not looking like the typical new house that we need for the young family or the typical um, apartment that we need for the aging resident. Um, are you seeing creative ways for us to adapt our existing housing stock to um, make room for uh, new ways to accommodate our housing needs as a state? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great uh, question, Bobby. Um, Vermont recognizes that you know, we have this missing middle uh, housing uh, stock and also um, you know, there are certain limitations. We don't want to change the, the character of, of Vermont. You know, we don't want to see a whole bunch of suburban neighborhoods pop up and, and feel like you're living, it could be any other state. You know, you could be living in Illinois or, or you know, Tennessee or, you know, it, 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 Vermont has a unique character and quality. People like a walkable village. You know, it's very uh, human in, in scale. We don't have a lot of tall buildings or massive um, uh, developments. And, but on the same token, we also don't want to just chop up all the open space and, and into small 
pieces, you know. So, you know, cluster developing where people are living in a, in a more walkable, mixed use kind of development is, is really a goal for Vermont. Um, and to, you know, preserve the, 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 the open space and the scenery, the nature that, that really is Vermont and, and characterizes that. So um, there's funding there um, for that. And, you know, we can talk about that, um, you know, if, if you want. Sure. Well, I mean, so you're an architect, Taylor, right? So you're seeing, you're kind of, in a way, on the front lines of um, the workforce needs as well as the funding sources. How do we actually adapt um, right. our, our housing stock? And so, yeah, what are, what are you seeing as some paths forward, both in terms of resourcing, adapt the, the adaptations that we need, um, as Good. well as getting the word out and making sure that people understand that um, there are options available if their housing um, is either no longer suiting them or if they need um, a new solution to their to their housing needs. Right, right. So, so tying back into the the concept of preserving open space, um, you know, rather than taking a farm field and just and putting a whole bunch of homes all, each on a two acre lot. Uh, and doing the cluster, that's a way to preserve, uh, you know, what's referred to in the industry as green fields, meaning land that's never been developed, it's still green. And uh, infill housing is much more preferred. Uh, you know, it's saying, well, we already have a home on a two acre lot, is there room to put an accessory dwelling unit on site? Or convert a garage or carriage house to an apartment? Or uh, maybe in a case where, of a large home, being able to find a way to, to truly make a separate independent a apartment with its own kitchen, living, sleeping area, and, and separate entrance. You know? So the Ver Vermont has uh, introduced funding, specifically grant money, to help uh, people uh, create those kinds of, of housing units. And that's really useful for. Um, you know, a lot of people have uh, space. You know, they have a, a home that's too big for them. Uh, you may, perhaps they're an empty nester and, uh, and they no longer, you know, need all that, all that, um, that many, that much house. And uh, this is a way for them to not have to sell the home they've been living in for 20, 30 years and, and move into some apartment somewhere. But they can actually uh, create an apartment right in their home. Not a roommate situation, but a truly independent, separate apartment. Um, that they can rent out for income to help them, you know, cover the costs of, of maintaining a property. Uh, but also, it's actually, um, you know, there's no stipulation that says you have to rent it to a stranger off the street or put an ad in the newspaper. You can, you can create an apartment and have a family member uh, move in. You know, you can have your kids home from college living, you know, so they don't have to live with you, but they can live there. Or the other way around, you know, if you have aging parents, you can create an in-law apartment and, and have mom and dad at home with you, but not, you know, in. You know, people need some separation and privacy, especially, you know, multi-generational families that have different um, uh, lifestyle schedules, sleeping habits, etc. So really the, the funding is there um, specifically to target helping people create infill housing or uh, modify and adapt and reuse, repurpose um, the existing homes. And it's much more economical to, to mostly, usually it's more economical to um, uh, re, redefine and redevelop an existing ho building or home uh, rather than start from the ground up with a, a brand new foundation, the whole thing, you know, it's, it's uh, so it's really kind of the low hanging fruit in terms of uh, for, for the least amount of money and the fastest, shortest time to creating housing to relieve that, that pressure, that's really the, the, where we want to focus, is right there in between the margins of, of what's already built. Right. And while still, you know, do you, do you think it's still typically possible, it's possible to maintain the um, architectural character of the house when you're, you know, putting in a renovation like that? I mean, that might be a concern for some people. Is that yeah. something that's typically possible when you're doing a renovation project like this? Uh, it's what uh, it's what myself as a as a licensed architect and and everyone in the profession uh, strives for, truly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's how can we create a renovation or an addition that doesn't look like it happened. You know, we want we want modern amenities. We want energy efficiency. We want to create you know low maintenance or no maintenance situations for people. Um, so they can spend more time living and less time, you know, painting and 
maintaining their, mm -hmm. their home, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to uh, uh, incorporate all of our modern um, technologies and uh, also retain that, that charm and, and, and old world character. Right. And so you mentioned the funding. What, can you tell us a little bit the f about the funding source and, and how it works? Sure. So uh, uh, we call it VHIP, the Vermont Housing Improvement Program. They uh, have specifically created uh, two funds. One is for landlords, property owners, and whether that's uh, you know uh, uh, a one person who bought the house next door or a duplex, you know, as as a rental apartment, all the way up to landlords who have hundreds of of apartment units. Um, you know, some of the units have been um, vacant for some time. They've been uh, run down. They need work. Maybe they had. Um, you know, a little bit of damage in the unit, and they're sitting there going, "Well, I, you know, I don't have twenty thousand dollars to to rehab my apartment, and so it sits there vacant." And uh, the uh, so VHIP says, "Well, we have a need for housing, and we know that it's better to have people in in apartments than than in a space that doesn't work for them. You know, we don't need that. No one wants to to be pinched in a shoe that doesn't fit, right? So, um, so the, so one." Uh, avenue of funding from VHIP is for rehabilitation of existing apartment units. And the other is for creation of new apartment units, new accessory dwelling units. Right. And whether that is attached to the home where you know maybe it's uh, converting the attic space or second floor to its own apartment or maybe it's uh, the basement, maybe it's um, you know cutting off, uh, you know separating off one wing of, of a house you know um, so to create a separate apartment. It can also be completely detached. It can be, you know, converting that uh, barn or garage or carriage house into uh, into a little cottage. Or it could be creating a brand new uh, cottage, you know, somewhere else on their property. So it it's very flexible in terms of what that looks like, but creating a, an auxiliary um, apartment is, uh, there's funding available for that and uh, it's encouraged. And so I know that uh, individual municipalities and zoning districts are rewriting their zoning uh, regulations to allow, even in uh, single family, they say single family residences only, they're now changing that to say single family and an accessory dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of progression um, and support, you know, not just financially, but also um, in the very um, zoning regulations themselves uh, yeah. to, to help Vermonters, um, you know, create, create adapt the housing in a way that works for them. Right. How much does the program cover in terms of the expense, the costs of actually doing that renovation? Sure. So uh, the to bring apartments back online, uh, it's up to thirty thousand dollars per per apartment, and uh, for the accessory dwelling unit, it's up to fifty thousand dollars is what's available, and that covers um, pretty much anything you can think of. Um, you know, in terms of Planning or permit fees or engineering or architecture or contractors or materials purchase, you know, the, the whole scope from 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 idea to final nail in construction is is um, all of that scope is is um, eligible for for funding. Does it get the place uh, you know ready to rent or I mean like there's still there are appliances, there's you know, furnishing or like does any of that get included or how does you know? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're, you know, if you have an existing apartment, you know, you've got a duplex or something, or you know, apartment building that that needs some renovation work. Um, yes, purchasing new appliances um, mm -hmm. is is a legitimate expense that's reimbursable uh, through the VHIP grant program, uh, as well as painting or polishing the floors or putting down new floors or anything related to getting the space habitable. Right. Is it a reimbursement program? Uh, it's it's actually the funds are distributed in four tranches, right? So one, you know, 25% right at the beginning of when your application is approved and you're and you're going to start construction, and then uh, another 25% is is done at a milestone, you know, based on once you've started construction, you're sort of halfway through kind of thing, and uh, then uh, a third um, is done um, uh, as you um, uh, get closer to the end of, of the construction. Mm -hmm. And then finally, when you have a, a, a signed lease agreement in place and a tenant is ready to move in. And, and again, that can be, you know, that could be your, your uh, uh, one of your in-laws. It can be a friend or a relative. You could rent it to them for a dollar. You know, that could be a legitimate lease. It doesn't say you have to rent it for any certain amount of, mm -hmm. of money. Um, 
but there is a limit. Uh, it, when you receive the funds, you um, you promise that you're going to rent the unit at uh, HUD market rate. So mm -hmm. you know perhaps, um, and that's basically they determine that by you know I think it's 120 percent. It depends on the district on the, on the neighborhood, but it's anywhere from 80 to 100 percent of the median income is is now what they figure out what the unit cost should be. Right. So you're saying, well, instead of renting it for a thousand dollars a month, I'm going to rent it for eight eight fifty a month or right. something like that. Right. You can always rent it for less than that, but you and you can always it. rent it for for less, but you can't rent it for more. But f that's just for five years, and after the five year period, then you can do whatever you want to with it. So okay. it's not the grant money is not there for you to create an Airbnb. You know, it's it's there is for you. To, is that explicitly not allowed? I guess because you need a lease agreement in place. You need a lease agreement. You're supposed to create housing for someone to live in full time. Right. Right, and so the state is not paying the contractor. The, sp the state pays the the homeowner. The, the homeowner, and then the homeowner yeah. is working through working with contractors directly. Is that typically? Okay? That's right. Yeah, okay. yeah. the homeowner will um, hire a, a contractor or an architect uh, uh, to work with contractors on their behalf to get the project done. Um, and th so the homeowner should have some money. Uh, either equity that they can borrow against from a home equity line of credit, or some cash in the bank to to make the process happen, and then they will get reimbursed. You know, they'll apply for these milestone payments. You know, uh, from the, from the state. Right. Okay. So it does require at least a little bit of that upfront equity it, in order to. Actually, it re you, know. you have to have a little bit of working capital. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and whether that's cash in the bank or you know equity in your home right. or in the property that you can you know mm -hmm. borrow against. That's you know both of those are. Are acceptable. Right. So, have you done this with any homeowners in Vermont? So, I am working with a woman in Williston. Uh, it's it's such a wonderful story. I'm, I'm really inspired by it. She's she's 65 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, she's an empty nester. You know, her her kids are grown and 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 gone, and um, she has four bedrooms and she's got all this space and she says, "What am I What am I doing here? You know, it's too big for me." But she doesn't want to sell because she's she's been living there for 30 years. You know, she's, she loves her, her home and the location and so many memories there, you know, and she likes to be able to invite, you know, kids back for, for um, you know, weekend visits and stuff. Um, but, you know, she, she is still working. She, she's active in the community and she has an income, but she's slowing down, you know, and she sort of has a five-year plan uh, to, to retirement. And right now, um, you know, she can, you know, carry the, the property, but you know, it's she's sort of house poor. You know, all of her money goes to just you know maintaining this this big property. You know, mm -hmm. and she doesn't have a lot of extra you know discretionary income or or you know um, just putting things you know even even just boosting things up for, for boosting up her savings account. You know, for for retirement. Mm -hmm. um, so she had these different ideas. Well, what should we do? You know, should we um, build an accessory dwelling unit, you know, put a cottage out. She has five acres of land. Should we, should we put a cottage out over there, you know, or should we subdivide the, the, the existing house, you know, mm -hmm. so that, you know, a family could move into it mm -hmm. at some point. And so um, really, you know, every property is unique. Every person's situation is their own. And so, you know, one of the things that I can help people with, that I help people with is I, is I look at, well, here's option A, here's option B, here's option C. Here's all the different things we could do. What's the What's perhaps the optimum uh, option for you, based on where you want to go in your in your circumstances? You know, both architecturally speaking, but also your personal goals. You know, your lifestyle goals. How can we find the best way to adapt this property? And so, looking at options and coming up with solutions—that's really um, the the purvey of, of an architect of, um, and a designer, right? So, uh, she what it comes out what she wants to do is actually create an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, elsewhere on the property um, that she will rent for five years, which is required by the uh, the VHIP um, rules of the, to receive that funding. She will rent this um, out for five years, and then when she's truly retiring at 70, um, she plans to uh, move into that unit herself and and really downsize, and then rent the whole the whole house out to a to a large family. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know. It works very well for her, and you know, by that time, her kids may have kids, and they may be ready to move back home and have the big house, you know. And she lives in the backyard, you know. Grandma's in the back, you know. It's and so the family stays together. There's, you know, it, it leaves the door open for that kind of possibility, mm -hmm. you know. 
and uh, and it certainly adds value to the property. You know, because if you imagine a property going up for sale on the market, five acres, you know, five acres of land with a four bedroom house, sounds like a great a great property. But if you say five acres of land with a four bedroom house and a one bedroom guest cottage in the back, that's that's much more attractive. It gives you much more options. You know, that's a much more desirable property. So not only is she making it um, livable, more livable for her direct situation, she's also creating value, adding value to the to her land and to her investment that she can pass on to her, to her kids. Right. That's a that's a really wonderful story. Um, what do you think are, I mean, do you see uptake for this program happening mm. across the state? I mean, you mentioned, so this is yeah. one project that you're working on. Right. Um, what do you think are the obstacles that, oh, that people are facing when they're yeah. trying to, um, is it just that they don't know about it or are they coming up against some, some challenges when, when they um, go to access yeah, this that, program? Yeah, that's, that's great. I, so I've been working with my uh, planning, local planning commission, planning department and uh, in, in my town. And I, I posted a, a thing about this program. I posted a notice on the front page, uh, front porch forum. You know, it's a, it's a e-newsletter that goes out to every little neighborhood around every town. And uh, I got a call from the planning department saying, oh, we're so glad that you're talking about this because we're not getting any applications for this program. You know, it's people just don't know about it, we think. And, and I said, well, you know, A, people don't know about it, or if they have heard of it, um, they maybe don't know how to navigate it. They don't know how to go after the funds. They don't know how to apply. They don't even know where to find an application. Mm -hmm. And what's that like? It just seems difficult. It seems like a, like a mountain that they have to climb. And, and if they're not used to um, you know, researching properties and looking at building codes and zoning codes and, and that whole process, um, then, it's, then it's even more difficult. I know when I was first um, exploring it to educate myself uh, about it, I felt a little uh, hesitation, a little trepidation. There was some, there was some friction you know, to, to, to overcome for me to, to jump in and roll up my sleeves and say, well, what's this all about? What's the process? And so I went ahead and um, navigated my way to, to the VHIP website and downloaded an application. I read all the contingencies and what it was appropriate for and what things weren't. it was not appropriate for. And then I filled out an application, a mock application with myself as the client so I could put an ADU for my mother-in-law on my land. And after I went through that process, I said, you know what, it was a little difficult because I felt like I was bushwhacking to the weeds, but it's actually not that hard. And once you've done it once, you can do it so much, uh, it's just, it's very simple. You know, once the path has been carved, you just walk along. And so that's why um, I'm offering to help people mm -hmm. in that process. You know, I can help them, A, you know, look at their property and figure out what's the best way to, to, to you know, to, develop it or divide it and, and, and build on it. It can also help them um, navigate the process to accessing grant money. It can help them uh, find uh, responsible contractors to, you know, it's basically, I'm, I'm like a, a concierge, you know, where I'll, I'll, I'll take a, pr a property owner and walk them right through from, from their big idea all the way to, you know, completion and, and, and moving in. Right. Is there any, are there any communities or, uh, segments of communities in Vermont where this program, where people wouldn't be eligible for this program? Are there any restrictions in terms of eligibility that would make it difficult for someone to access this resource? Um, not that I'm aware of. You um, mentioned before that, um, that you know, some towns have actually been, you know, sort of revamping their zoning uh, mm -hmm. to, to make sure that uh, certain neighborhoods aren't restricted to just single family homes and, and sure. can have accessory dwelling units. Are, are there right. some municipalities that, you know, just, I, I don't know if you know or not, but whether yeah. are, that, you know, that are, that are sort so, of restricting. Um, yeah. yeah, so there's sort of a, a, a statewide sort of mandate saying we want all, you know, like, like, like we talked about before, even if your district, even if your neighborhood is zoned single family residential only, mm -hmm. um, there's sort of a statewide, you know, along with this whole, you know, um, push to, to solve the housing, um, they've requested that um, every local jurisdiction implement this by the end of 2024. So many of them have done, it, done so already, um, but so a few stragglers, you know, there are some very rural areas that don't even have a zoning um, department or a planning and building department, and they, and they send people at the county level or to the town next, 
next door to them. You know, there's some pockets of Vermont that have no zoning. Mm -hmm. And so they may be slower to adopt changing zoning regulations because they're, they don't exist or it's a very part-time volunteer situation from local people. So um, I don't expect that a person, even if they were living in such a place, that they would find any kind of resistance to, to doing this, though. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, um, you know, uh, it's housing, it's about, it's for everyone. So it's, there's not going to be any kind of, they're not saying you can do it and you can't. It's, there's no, you know, sort of discrimination there other than, um, you know, you need to be um, creating housing that's um, not rented, you know, it's, it, there's a cap on what you can rent it for for the first five years, mm -hmm. and that it's um, rented full time, not as a vacation, you know, uh, property. Right. Well, Taylor Stewart, I really appreciate your perspective. So, if someone wants to um, is seeking out your guidance on this sure. process, uh, how can they get in touch with you? Um, I, the simplest way is just to go to my website, uh, VermontHomeDesign.com. And uh, my phone number and uh, contact information is, is there, and they're welcome to uh, uh, reach out if they want me um, to, you know, if they want to discuss their project with me. That's great. And then we didn't even really get a chance to discuss too much. You brought your book that you oh, released yeah. a few years sure. ago. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about so conscious home design? What does that mean? And um, you know, does are are you using that the principles of conscious home design? Um, and your work as an architect, and what, what does that look like? Sure. Uh, so conscious home design is really a, a big idea. It mm -hmm. says that homes are uh, can be more than just beautiful shelter. Mm -hmm. um, you know that that you know we're as human beings, we have our needs are diverse. We may have you know we have uh, creative expression needs. We have uh, love and belonging needs. We we want to have relationships. We want to have a life of purpose and meaning. You know, it's it's really based in uh, you know what we know from from Maslow's the hierarchy of human needs pyramid. Uh, you know, we're not simply animals that just need food and shelter, you know. Um, we have, you know, we're more complex than that. And so, you know, there's a big, it's interesting tying, it ties in with uh, Vermont's aging population. You know, we have such a, we have such a, um, a heavy leaning towards the baby boom generation as people are, are living longer. And uh, there's a big um, uh, phenomenon around the world uh, in certain pockets where people are, are, are living to 100 years old, you know, the centenarians. And uh, it's like, well, what what do all these people have in common? You know, what's what uh, what are they all doing? Because these people are in Italy, these people are in Japan, these people are in California. It's like they're all over the world. And uh, conscious home design is really about saying, well, what are the things that make life uh, rich and meaningful and 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 alive? You know, and worthwhile for for you, so that you can create your own, um, you know, sort of paradise, right? Have your, your own home be that place of, of self-expression and, and self-development uh, and connection. So that's, uh, that's sort of the big idea of Conscious Home Design. And uh, yeah, uh, you can also get a copy of that on, on my website. There's a link there. So, or we hit number one on Amazon a couple of years ago, so it's available wow. online. That's great. Well, Taylor Stewart, architect and author based out of Bennington, is that correct? Yeah, Shaftesbury. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I work all over the state. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming in and talking with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, of course. And thank you for tuning in to Town Meeting TV. Uh, my name is Bobby Lucier, and uh, feel free to check out our website, ch17.tv, or our YouTube channel, Town Meeting TV, to find this and other programs covering your local community. Thanks so much and so long.